All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And, uh, well, I was planning on doing a completely different video. Well, not completely different, but anyway, in preparation for the video that I wanted to do, uh, I came across a Mandela effect. And so, anyway, Guy Fox, this is kind of going out to you, man. Um, I feel so much of what you're saying, and uh, but anyway, I the last the last few months, I would say since the beginning of November, I have had a uh, fairly, I guess, just a draft drastic shift in mindset, and uh, and I feel better. And so I just want to share some things with you. And um, I'll start off here just by, I'm going to start with this Mandela effect because <laughs> it just it just blows me away. But anyway, I was going to look up the word. You know, who who is the word, basically? And what does the Bible say about that? Because, you know, quote, Christians here in, in the U.S., they always say, oh, the Bible is the Word of God, you know, but the Bible never claims to be the Word of God. Uh, in fact, they always claim that Jesus is the Word of God, and Christians will claim that too, and of course they always quote John 1, you know, and so <clears throat> anyway, my my shift my mindset shift um, came about basically because I came to a a knowledge like a realization and a knowledge just about God and God's nature and um, and I feel good about it and it and I, a lot of it had to do with just using logic on uh, what the the Christian community claims with their doctrine and what the Bible actually says. Uh, you know, and, and we go around here in the Mandela Effect community um, with the Bible changes and of course you know, most Christians say that, oh, it's the inerrant word of God. It cannot change. And, uh, of course, I always ask the question, well, why give a warning against something that's not possible, you know? So, uh, and then, then I'll also say that, well, the, the very word translation needs to change. <laughs> so, uh anyway there's that and then just now so I I wanted to look up what the word was because I was I was brought up in a Baptist home I went to a Christian elementary school and all the way up into seventh grade and then eighth grade I went into public education but I had and I, you know, and I've gone to church my entire life, you know, up until, well, when I got, when I got older, I stopped going to church, but, uh, anyway, so my parents, I, I've, I've had problems and throughout my life, and anyway, I just recently had some more problems, but, uh, this time, instead of, I guess feeling so bad about it, I just uh, chose to change the way I I felt about it and looked looked at it, and a lot of it had to do with my my concepts around God um, and human beings. So anyway, here's the Mandela effect. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, there's always the John one, and then it was always here in. Hold on, I 
just a second. Excuse me, I had to clear my throat. Uh, it had always been here in, uh, what is it, Revelation 19 down at verse 11, that the rider on the white horse uh, had the, um, he had the name written on his thigh, and it was the word. And that was like the second place in the King James. Oh, and also I was brought up with King James. So I, I even have a, I still to this day have a blue ribbon that I got a first place in Bible memorization in first grade. And we had like a, a spelling bee, but we had a Bible bee. And uh, I got first place for Bible memorization that year. So, yeah, when John 3.16 changed on me and all of a sudden they want me to believe that, uh, you know, it would sound better for Gandalf to stand in front of the Balrog and say, you should not pass. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, John 3.16 was always a definite. <laughs> and it was always a shall. I remember that as a child we had many lessons about how we could be very sure of our salvation. But now we just, you know, we shouldn't die. We should, <laughs> shouldn't perish. Should not perish. It was always shall for me. Anyway, so, and then you know how this works, guy. I was like, wow, I was just looking at this right now. And so obviously here, here we are in the KJV. Now let's go to the Berean... Uh, it's the Berean literal. Where's the Berean literal? Uh, hmm. Well, let's go to the BSB. Uh, he, and he has a name right... Oh, no, that one's not it. I was just looking at it, too. Where is... Maybe I can back up. Uh, ah, Berean literal Bible. Here we go. Berean literal, let's see, ah, oh, here it is, and his name is called the Word of God. That is what I remember. So, Mandela effect. <laughs> and yeah, it's crazy. So yes, this world is crazy. Now, heaven and hell um, is a concept that gets thrown around in Christianity, or pretty much, you know, Christians throw that around everywhere and everybody thinks of heaven or hell or maybe they don't believe in it or whatever uh, but I I have questioned ever since I was a child free will that that question has uh, bothered me because as a child I remember I can remember one time specifically being in tears, uh, talking with my mother, and we were going back and forth about uh, about accepting Jesus as Savior, and I was saying at the time when I was a, a child, so I accepted Jesus in my heart when I was four years old, and I remember I had I had gotten in trouble for something. I was up at my grandparents' house, and uh, well, we used to. My, I'll back up. My, uh, my grandfather was a preacher, so my mother is a PK. And anyway, we live in Southern California, and my grandparents and my mother's sisters all live up in Washington uh, in Tacoma and Bainbridge Island and you know around the Seattle area there uh, Gig Harbor and whatnot so anyway we would go up every year for Christmas and visit the grandparents and so when I was four I got in trouble I was in there with my dad my dad was talking to me or whatever and uh, I decided to accept Jesus in my heart and like all my sins were forgiven you know and so I remembered 
uh, later on that, you know, it was sure, like, Jesus, there was nothing I could do. Jesus was always going to be in my heart. And I remember later on, uh, I remember that I couldn't do certain things that I wanted to do because I was a Christian. And I don't remember what it was at the time. I mean, I was a child. Uh, it was probably like watch some movie or something that my friend could or, you know, and I couldn't. or I don't even remember, but I was, I was young enough to, to want to reach into my chest and pull Jesus out of my heart. <laughs> like wanting to do that, you know, and thinking like, well, I already... I asked Jesus into my heart, so I, I can't ever go back. And uh, I was like, I, I was talking with my mom, and and she was telling me about how we have free will, and, you know, how Jesus wants us, you know, God wants us to love him. And I, I was like, well, what kind of a choice is that I go that that's like a and I had this conversation with her several times I had the the one conversation when I was young wanting to pull Jesus out of my heart and later on I was talking to her about free will and I I said what kind of a choice is is a God that sets up all the rules and then says, okay, you can do what I want, and everything's going to be great. Or, if you don't, then I'm going to send you to hell. I go, that's like a, a mobster putting a gun to your head and saying, hey, guess what? You can run the business for me, and everything's going to be great. But if you don't, it's going to be one in the head. You know? And so that never really made sense to me. Um, that was a problem. And so think about heaven and hell. And so several years ago now, I came to the conclusion that the Bible actually does not teach that, um, that hell is eternal. Um, I mean, there, you know, I'm, I'm sure a guy that you know the, you've studied enough, you know the different concepts. But anyway... I tend to think of like if if there's a hell in the way that's described or whatever that uh, that the fire can go on forever but the people burn up and so they you know we're supposed to our teachers tell us oh use the parables you know gain uh, heavenly meaning from earthly stories or whatever you know we're supposed to draw parallels from these analogies and whatever and so you know I can think of a fire and I can think of how to keep a fire going and going that's by throwing more sticks into it <laughs> and so if humanity keeps going on then uh, there's going to be plenty of sticks to keep that fire going you know oh but the worm never dies okay well I don't know about the worm uh, maybe the worm doesn't die, but that doesn't, to me, it's since God, God created everything. That's what the Christians say, and I, I believe that too. So, and I'm a, I am a Christian. Let's just, I will throw that out there. I am still a Christian. And uh, anyway, so God created everything. And it would be, and since he, since he created everything, he created our sense of justice. And it would be completely unjust for any being to dish out an eternal punishment for a finite crime. That's, that's just, uh, that's... <laughs> That's just cruel. That's anything but loving. And then, you know, oh, well, well but God is just. Is that just? <laughs> I, I say no. That's an, an eternal punishment for a finite crime is not just. So, if 
I will I will even go as far as to say that the Bible is correct but the the Christians in the United States and so I will just say the majority because that's what I know is the Christians in the United States are completely off on so much that is taught um, I mean it's almost like 180 degrees from what is actually being said in the Bible and so guy I get you when you don't want to go to church and you don't feel um, you don't feel the camaraderie it's because uh, it's because God really isn't there. Well, actually, I don't know that he is. <laughs> and at least these people are acknowledging God. Um, so, man. Guy, I was, I've been thinking about life too and wondering about, okay, since... I also, what I do know is that God is a loving God. God created all. He says, I am the great I am. And so he is all, and he created all, and everything is going to return to him. There is, I do not believe that there is this, it is impossible to be separated from God. It's absolutely impossible. And so, it, I just, I think that most likely, you know, I, there were many things, I believed in the pre-tribulation rapture for my entire life. That's what I was brought up with. And, uh, and now I know that's completely false and the, the Bible actually teaches that you will be there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's what it says. And uh, then at the final trump, that's when Jesus is coming back. And so these people, the pre-tribbers have, they never have the rapture happen without the final trump. <laughs> and it's like they don't get that. And they also don't get that their, their entire their entire argument is based upon they say that well you know the restrainer is is no longer going to restrain you know he him who letteth will let no more or will let or whatever I know it's all funky in the King James now but uh, I'm gonna go into the temple and I believe that the the temple is the body I mean, that's what Jesus said. And there, I believe it was in Luke, you know, that he said, oh, tear down this temple, I'll build it again in three days. It says right there, oh, they didn't understand what he was talking about, but he was talking about his body. And then later on, Paul says, uh, you know ye not that your bodies are the temple of God? And so the abomination of desolation has to do with the temple, which is the body. And I think that the... Uh, the whole that thing you know when that happens and they say oh everybody run for the hills sort of a thing that'll be like when the AI this entity goes in to the temple and declares himself to be God and so it'll be like your phone or like like Bluetooth or whatever and everybody will be you know everybody will be jacked in and online and when you walk by each other they'll be looking for the each other's signal you know like oh can I connect with this one just like your phones in your pocket you know and your Bluetooth so it'll just be in your head though and everybody will know if you're online with them so that's why the Bible's like oh yeah you got to run for the hills because they're gonna know they're gonna look at you oh what he's not jacked in this guy's he's he's not part of the swarm so yeah that's what that's about but anyway the whole thing is is like God God created everything and guess what none of this matters and that uh, that is a depressing thought 
but it's also it's also a very warm comforting thought and uh, and since we are created in the image of God we are creative beings and I've really been it really is true that we create we create our reality and you know Rome wasn't built in the day the you know walk of a thousand miles begins with one step but we do create our reality and in t the whole thing about intention all that stuff that that is real as well and uh, I mean look at look at all the things that get demonized and then apply that to the religious world as well and so how I've been happy about that is that I realized <clears throat> I, I was listening to your video and you said I'm gonna I want to to fight against uh, anything that I can't remember exactly what you said but basically you were saying you you wanted to fight against it and I have spent my entire life well I'll tell you I'm I'll be I'll be 50 in June uh, June 10th is my birthday and I spent a great deal of my life looking looking out and saying I don't want that to happen I don't want this to happen and I, I would put energy into resisting or trying to fix the things that I, I saw out there and I realized that it it really is true that the work happens on the inside and then things flow outward from there and I, this is all for me it, it's all things it's ideas that I've had bouncing around in my head you know I had a lot of pieces I had all the pieces I know all the stuff but all of a sudden it's like these things really clicked for me in an experiential way and it's the difference between book smarts and knowing and you can create yeah you can create what you you know to the same stimuli creates a heaven and the same stimuli creates a hell so you know this I believe in in realms because I don't know what to think about the shape of the earth or whatever anymore and quite honestly I think that this is a, a digital realm and it could probably be round or flat dependent upon what you're looking at at the time <laughs> because it seems to be a lot of that uh, and since we're creative beings well we get we get to create it and and God created the evil too the Bible says that and, and just realizing that that he created that too and that gives me the opportunity to feel and do whatever I want about any given situation but I'd also don't have to feel bad about it because at the end of the day God is all and God is all in all and everything came from him everything will return to him the, the path may be different and there may be you know maybe you might get burnt up at the end and it, but doesn't the parable say oh you know the the wood hay and stubble burn up but the the jewels or whatever remain you know the precious stuff you know maybe that's that's like what it is oh, I was also trying to reconcile uh, the every man is appointed once to die and the Hindu belief of reincarnation 
and I, I, I wonder what you think about this guy. Um, so the, the Hindu belief of reincarnation, as far as I understand it, is that the life recycles and doesn't uh, necessarily retain specific memories. At a lot of time there's like a, you, you have like a wash or a forget when you enter into the new body and uh, you enter in at a, at a karmic level. So, anyway, and then the the Christ or Christian and uh, you know other belief. I guess you can believe it in nihilism or that life continues on. Oh, again, if the gift of God is eternal life, well, eternal life in hell is you already have eternal life. So eternal life is not a gift if you're going to live forever in hell anyway. Okay, that's another side point. Um, oh man, now I t completely lost my train of... Oh, so the life continues on. Well, what if it is like a video game and the gamer is outside of the game? He's he's the one who has the mouse and the keyboard or he has the the controller in his hand and then there's the character alive within the game and it goes through the level of, oh and it dies and it just had had one life it only gets that one life and that but it can respawn boom it responds and he gets another life but he doesn't he doesn't necessarily remember like he just he popped up in there you know he, he spawned again. He's new. He doesn't necessarily remember what's going on. He's like, ah, I think I've seen this. You know, maybe this is the guy in the character. But the gamer, he's, he is controlling. He still is on one life. So maybe the, the gamer is the one life. And here, we're like the character in the video game that goes and you know maybe that's deja vu it's like well, well our we us is playing us down here and we went oh i don't want to do that kind of different or you know the, we can have the, the the karmic level sort of a thing oh okay we we got through this level we beat this badass Oh, and that's another thing too, looking at life at, really as a game and thinking about your struggles and everything like that, um, Guy. Every game is a struggle and that's why we love it. And uh, it wouldn't be cool if it wasn't a, a struggle. And I, it, the games suck when they feel that when you feel that uh, you can't beat them, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I'm not even going to play that game. That's that's way too hard. But, you know, this is a, a huge game, and maybe you can just change the, the game, you know. And so you can create anything you want. And, Guy, thank you for everything you, you've said. Love you. And uh, I hope this rant makes it to you. Have a good one.